Welcome and thanks for joining us. My guest today is Jeff Luckett. He's a technical lead on the NRDE cloud contract for GDIT. Jeff, good to have you with us. Hey, thanks for having me. Let's begin with the big picture, and that is the cloud challenge pain points that you're finding now, especially in the DOD domain of cloud migration, because these things tend to migrate and change over time. So what are the current kind of pain points, if you will? Well, uh, on the cloud contract side of things, uh, we generally start trying to address pain points early because we see them pretty often. Some of the common ones that we see are uh, regulatory frameworks um, that are that are needed to be met. Uh, we're looking at different government agencies that do things like PCI, HIPAA, uh, and in the DOD specifically, FedRAMP and cloud at specific impact levels, which contains data that could be classified. Uh, that can drive kind of the architecture decisions at the highest levels um, and kind of filter down into the security and architecture concerns with uh, availability of the uh, data, which uh, you can use different things in the cloud to make your data more highly available, your data or your applications. Um, the protection of your data, uh, that's a huge, a huge business at the DOD and continuity of services in the uh, disaster recovery and data backup restore realm. Um, it, it can add a lot of different layers to the complexity of a cloud migration task. So we like to pay close attention to those sorts of things. Um, and GDIT specializes in cloud transformation for, um, for government customers. So in our cloud transformation, we focus on uh, the, the previous things that I mentioned to kind of get a feel for what the approved tools are gonna be for that customer inside that specific cloud provider. We go cloud agnostic uh, with our approach. So the customer's preference is our preference. We, uh, we try to educate the customers on cloud native tool utilization um, to benefit their transformation because a one-to-one -one transformation into the cloud may not necessarily be the most efficient way of doing things. We also have a lot of different resources at our disposal as a large corporation, such as a cloud center of excellence, which gives us reach back to SMEs and almost everything you can think of. Um, and they provide training back down to the programs like us for things like uh, well-architected frameworks and uh, other governance type capabilities. So in many ways, then the migration, a given migration really has to start with a careful selection of the application and the data associated with it. One, so that technically it is suitable for the cloud, but also so that whatever compliance and uh, risk framework types of considerations you might have for that application and data can be met in the cloud just as it would be in the agency's own data center. That's correct, yes. Uh, and, and all of those things can kind of congeal together to make for a challenging project at the minimum, right? But with some of the pre-built uh, frameworks that GDIT has made in the cloud space and being one of the leading government contractors in the cloud now, uh, we we are uniquely positioned to be able to positively impact those projects from day one. And again, here in approaching the middle of 2021, what are some of the best practices for security in the cloud, especially pursuant to that all important authority to operate the ATO, which is something that across the board in DOD, they say they want to automate and speed up because that's just a big impediment sometimes to speed and agility is the ATO that they run into. Absolutely. The, the basics are still the number one thing that you want to pay attention to right out of the gate. Uh, you've got the basics like your Azure network security groups or your AWS security groups that you're going to be paying attention to. You'll still have uh, virtual machines more than likely in an application deployment. You'll still have to pay attention to the DOD uh, requirements on those, like having vulnerability scans, having host intrusion prevention, uh, and having the things that we love so much, uh, the STIGs. Uh, that's something that um, every DOD program has to worry about, and that's something that uh, GDIT works really hard to 
try to automate or at the very minimum provide the, the best service that we can on so that the customers don't have to worry about that. Once you get into the cloud, you need to start thinking about kind of the cloud specific security concerns like role-based access. Um, that is kind of a big, a big push in the cloud brokerage space where a master account will actually control a lot of different accounts under it. And through that control, they're exerting policies that enforce best practices down to the program cloud accounts. So that leaves the programs less to worry about on the security front. Um, as far as authorization goes, one of the really great things about uh, cloud brokers that's happening right now is that they are developing inheritance models that are based on the cloud brokerage itself. So the cloud brokerage can bring to the table these dependent services and, and features that will rapidly speed projects and programs uh, requests for ATO with, uh, with checklists that are filled out you know, significantly by these things that have already been thought about by the, uh, by the brokerage program. So that really kind of kicks off, I uh, uh, want to call it more of a golden age, right? Uh, the Air Force, the Navy, and the Army, uh, I think all four branches are looking at uh, this sort of model where you get to come in and you get to have 85 or 90% of your, uh, your RMF covered by a brokerage. Um, the, the biggest thing I think we have right now um, that we're working, especially on the Navy side, is the uh, kind of DevSecOps for the application side, because when you're talking about ATOs, you know, odds are you're talking about um, getting authorization to run some government off the shelf software. Uh, that's something that the Navy uh, at NIWIC and the NRDE program has been really pushing hard on. We are currently working on um, a live system that provides that same kind of base inheritance model for programs to come through with custom software development. And the Navy is providing the tooling for the code analysis, the uh, very important supply chain security now. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen that, but that's a very hot topic. And, uh, and, and several other things like containerized development, security, vulnerability, and compliance scanning. That, that ensure programs can get that base checklist out of the way for their authorization as quickly as possible. And does that idea of inheritance of authority to operate qualities, does that also occur in the DevSecOps operations where you're turning out in scrums or sprints functionality pieces of software that you can immediately deploy and then keep going on to the next one, knowing that you don't have to wait around for an ATO for the one you just released because it inherited qualities that were built in to the architecture and to the conception of the plan. Absolutely. Uh, NAWIC is really blazing trails on the Navy side on this front. Um, NAWIC and uh, the GDIT team, we've been working very closely with the NAO. Um, we've been working with uh, um, cybersecurity representatives all the way up and down the chain to make sure that we're getting the right information out of our out of our tool chains for software building security so that these programs can benefit uh, across the board, right? We're, we're trying to knock out that 90% of the mundane work that goes along with that. On top of that, NAWIC uh, is also working on kind of the common platform that goes out for things like afloat deployments that is a very exciting and will also provide another layer of inheritance for software projects that are going through to production. Yeah, especially if you have to deploy them on 300 ships, say a given system, and it may not be the precise same configuration on every single location, because really no two ships are alike, if truth be told. But nevertheless, the essential qualities are inherited such that it doesn't hold up the whole program because of small variations and configurations or something that may occur from, from instance to instance. Absolutely, and NAWIC is, is really leveraging the cloud to ensure that those small configuration differences don't become problems. They're working on um, being able to replicate the configuration from a ship into the cloud uh, in, in a secure space, obviously, but for integration testing of any applications coming through that are targeting specific platforms, uh, that's a huge leap 
from the old days where you had to carry CDs to a place and test them to make sure they weren't going to break everything else on a ship. So uh, Nowick has really embraced the, uh, the cloud mentality in that respect. And let's talk about the Naval Information Warfare Center. There's East and West, Pacific and Atlantic on that. How do you work with them? How do you align your services and products and technologies with their requirements? Because that would seem to be a pretty big meshing up that would have to happen to go forward on a long-term type of basis. Absolutely. So we started working this program with Nowick Pack. They're out of the Pacific in San Diego. Uh, Nowick Pack had a very large focus on the cloud, uh, and, and that focus on the cloud has led to GDIT and Nowick Pack developing offerings for uh, for remote work specifically, uh, because if you're doing a lot of work in the cloud, the cloud lives everywhere. So why do your employees have to live in one specific place, right? So the program kind of focused on um, three main areas. Uh, we helped Nowick to stand up a cloud brokerage where they can resell cloud accounts to other Navy programs who don't possibly have the resources or the time to go through all the contractual things to set up their own uh, kind of dedicated cloud accounts. Um, we also developed a remote access solution with them uh, with Citrix that involves uh, um, being able to spin up either an ephemeral or a persistent workstation on that network. What that means is that from an approved laptop, um, you can actually open up a desktop at now at Pacific and start doing work immediately. Uh, that kind of revolutionized how we do development with them because that really broadens the labor pool and the accessibility of the system and the network. Uh, and the third thing is in the uh, uh, software DevOps kind of arena. Uh, the, the Navy and the DOD have come out with guidance on DevSecOps, which is what they call it because security is super important in the DOD space. Um, and, and to be honest with you, that part was actually developed over the remote access systems from places like uh, North Carolina, uh, Louisiana, and not, you know, also San Diego, obviously, with folks that are on site. But we were, we were able to leverage those strides that we had taken before in developing kind of the remote access and the cloud functionalities to start building some bigger, more value add services on top of that. And on that broker idea, brokerage that you built for them, what are some of the considerations? I mean, aside from price, but clouds, commercial cloud offerings do differ technically and then the level of services they offer, the types and styles and technical interfaces that they offer. So how do you, how does the brokerage work and what are the criteria for saying it's going to go here or there, a given workload? So, yeah, no, absolutely. So the, the, General first step on that is that a customer program will come and request a cloud account. The customer program has choice. Uh, the customer can select a Microsoft Azure account. They can request an Amazon Web Services account. And I believe that the Google Cloud will be on contract shortly. Uh, so they would actually be able to come and ask for Google Cloud as well. Uh, the NRDE Cloud operates at impact level four, which is up to FOUO data. What that means is that we don't have cloud accounts that are wide open. They're all kind of on a closed network, uh, which is why the uh, virtual desktop solution was built to assist with access. Um, from there, the programs actually get uh, a, a lot of freedom and bandwidth to do what they want to do in the cloud account. Uh, now at Pacific Brokerage actually assists them with budgeting and they push down policies to that, uh, to that brokerage cloud account that prevent some of the common first timer mistakes like opening up a storage unit to the internet or something like that, right? Um, so now it can pretty tightly control that and give these customers a nice secure cloud space to start doing research and development in. Got it. And with respect to the uh, remote access, remote desktop, I imagine that has, well, was that a result of the pandemic or is it just a benefit to it having had it in place? We, we had it in place before the pandemic. I actually, I live in Louisiana and I was one of the principal developers of the collaborative software armory, which is the DevSecOps uh, project. 
that uh, that service did see a huge spike in usage after the pandemic because NIWIC was very responsive to their to their employees about going remote. Um, and to this day, we still are running at about 10 times the user count that we were running prior to the pandemic um, because uh, safety is one of their primary concerns. All right, and uh, on the DevOps front then, in, in some ways that's the classic original use of cloud as a place for DevOps, DevSecOps they call it now. So it sounds like a great deal of the developmental effort is simply cloud originating at this point in Nowick. Yeah, that's correct, yes. Uh, and one of the things, one of the drivers for DevSecOps uh, in the cloud was the fact that Nowick was already kind of in the forefront and providing their local command and the programs that live in San Diego at Nowick Pacific, a space to do secure software development and build. Um, what the cloud enabled is for them to reach out beyond uh, software development and build and look into integration testing and look into um, uh, actual deployment of artifacts, you know, outside of the existing frameworks that, it, that were in place before where uh, ships had to be docked for maintenance. So they really took the bull by the horns on that one uh, and, and started really leading the pack in getting ships fitted with the correct types of platforms to allow for over the air updates um, and then coming back and investing in the correct places so that software development targeting those platforms could go as quickly and securely as possible. And yeah, on that over the air idea of updating the ships where they are for the most part, I guess if they're right smack in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, maybe not so much, but they don't have to be in dry dock or in for maintenance. Does that speed up this whole idea of deploying a given capability across the fleet? Because that absolutely. used to take years. Yes, it, it absolutely did. I believe the quoted time frame um, from five years ago was something around 18 months from, uh, from authorization all the way through development authorization and pushing the update out to a ship. Um, I believe that uh, one of the uh, division heads that I worked with very closely once told me that um, he had hoped before the end of his career to see the last team of engineers with briefcases full of DVDs walking onto a ship. And that's something that GDIT, you know, that I took to heart and GDIT really took to heart in, in our efforts at NIWIC to help them get to the point where software development could be could be secure, it could be fast, and it could be reliable, right, for deployment onto these afloat platforms. So maybe they can use those CDs now for coasters in the officer's mess. <laughs> Absolutely. And there's another phenomenon that's happening in some vendors, and that is they are developing their own internal processes for software development and automation. In effect, not eating their own dog food, but creating it and serving it to customers. We can probably find a more elegant way to say that. But what has GDIT learned internally that it can transfer to the Navy, perhaps, for these automation and development processes? So GDIT has a huge internal organization that we have at our disposal for a lot of different things. Uh, the first one I wanted to kind of highlight was the DevOps Center of Excellence. Um, we can reach back to that internal organization at any time and get some of the uh, best and brightest people in the business to, to help us architect things, to help us figure out problems, or to share best practices with. And we have that ongoing two-way communication with them so that as we, since we're an R&D type program, as we are able to come up with new and interesting things to do, we can actually move that information back out of our program into their hands to share with other gov government programs. So that's one of the things we really highlight at GDIT is are these centers of excellence. We have one for DevOps, we have one for cloud, and we have several other uh, that, that relate to other types of government functions. Uh, another thing we have are communities of interest um, where like-minded engineers uh, and leaders can get together and share these ideas kind of off the cuff. Uh, lunch and learns, things like that come out of community interest. Lunch and learns uh, and, and other sharing sessions kind of come out of these communities of interest on a regular basis. 
and we're able to present our new ideas or the new types of automation or things that we're doing for our customers to a wider audience for adoption and, across the enterprise. And with everybody teleworking, you can probably reach hundreds or thousands of people at a time, as opposed to the 35 or so that can get over to that conference room on that date. Absolutely. Yeah, that's been a huge boon to us. Um, and also some of the uh, teleworking um, technology that's been provided by GDIT for our employees uh, has really enabled us to ramp up that sort of sharing. So, I mean, we've got access to Zoom, we've got access to Teams, and we have our internal Skype. Uh, so we've got several different channels that we can approach this over to provide these messages to as big an audience as we need to. And finally, you bring an ecosystem of vendor partners that have technical expertise in particular domains with you into the fleet into Nawick. Tell us more about some of those. Sure, absolutely. I, I wanted to do a few uh, uh, call outs because we do work with a lot of great industry partners. I'm going to talk about a few of them in no particular order. I have to say that up front. Um, so the first one I wanted to talk about was Amazon. Uh, they've been huge uh, in the cloud space at NIWIC and they've been, they've been very instrumental in working with both NIWIC and GDIT on providing you know, the best uh, service in the uh, cloud arena and providing training and some new, uh, some new functionality and features on the AI and machine learning fronts uh, that NIWIC has really taken advantage of as well. Uh, as far as the cloud brokerage goes, I see that as one of the big, uh, the big growing areas in the future for uh, research and development. Uh, the next partner is Microsoft. Uh, they've got a lot of the same credentials on the cloud side. They've been a fantastic partner. Uh, they have enabled the DOD to uh, collaborate effectively during the pandemic. Uh, they deserve all the shout outs in the world for that because uh, having team CVR available inside of the DOD was, uh, was a stroke of genius, in my opinion. Uh, that has brought so many different teams together to collaborate, uh, both contractor level and at the DOD level, um, to be able to get work done. I, I, when before, all of the different collaboration tools were kind of disparate, uh, depending on command. So that's kind of been a huge one. Uh, and they've also provided GDIT uh, specifically with a lot of help on the uh, DevOps research side of things, especially kind of in the Windows domain. Uh, the, the last but certainly not least that I wanted to kind of point out was our partnership with Red Hat. Red Hat has been instrumental in assisting us and NIWIC with architecting uh, the fleet modernization that's happening now. Uh, Red Hat is the provider of the platform that was selected to go out to the ships as the uh, as the kind of container platform as a service that uh, software development teams are developing against now. They've always had a very active role uh, with us in educating uh, and in innovating for the Navy to be able to kind of leverage the latest and greatest tooling that's available to them. And just a final question in the day-to-day -day work of software development and application development at Nawick, do Navy coders, are there Navy coders, and do they work alongside vendor partner coders? And does it seem like one virtual team in that sense? Absolutely. Yeah, uh, we've got coders everywhere from uh, civil service, uh, enlisted, academia, and, and contractors who can all work together now to accomplish you know, these bigger kind of research and development tasks and to get new tooling out to the fleet uh, more rapidly than ever. All right. On that note, we want to thank our guest today is Jeff Luckett. He's a technical lead for the NRDE cloud contract for GDIT. I'm Tom Temin. You've been listening to Federal News Network. For more on this discussion, please visit federalnewsnetwork.com and search GDIT. Now we send you back to the studio for more on the DOD cloud exchange.